Hi, I'm Bill Rubenstein, your SAT expert at Professorate.com. Now we're going to look at SAT critical reading, the short passage. In this segment, we'll look at a model of an SAT critical reading short passage with sample questions. I'll show you first how many students might try to answer the questions, explaining how they get caught up by the test makers, and show you a technique which is likely to get you the right answers. Before we start, though, I'd like to raise a first question that many students are likely to ask. Do I read the passage first or do I go straight to the questions? Test prep companies have lots of competing theories on this subject. On these short passages, I think you're better off reading the whole thing. It only takes a minute or so. When we get to the longer passages, things change, but later. So, you're going to read. But while you read, you should already be thinking of one key issue. What's the main point of this piece? You should also be trying to figure out who the writer or the voice of the piece might be. As you get more experienced, you'll use this reading time to hunt for potential SAT question seeds, those thematic and point of view beats which test makers use to construct the questions. Of course, if you're just starting out playing the game, you won't know what to look for, so just read along with me. Our waking hours rush by filled with worries, regrets, and memories. A text message flickers past as we roll along, splashing us in the face, not to forget about a meeting with the boss, a photograph on the wall, cascades us back to a carefree childhood 4th of July at grandmother's farm, eating huckleberry pie on a warm summer's afternoon. Before this thought is submerged in the next pool as a letter arrives, warning us that we're late on a credit card payment, images and events flood past before we're able to freeze them in our mind's eye. Or at least, this is the story we tell ourselves about how things are. The truth is, the brain is always picking and choosing what it notes, what it stores, how it stores it. The thing we call reality is actually a careful construction, the product of billions of neurons firing practically simultaneously with one single goal, to keep the organism safe. Wow, wasn't that a thrilling passage? Aren't you glad you read it? Before you answer that, ask yourself how the cop feels when he discovers the mangled corpse or how the doctor feels when he looks at your rash, or how a peace negotiator feels when he's handed his 600-page document translated from Romanian. The game isn't about whether the piece is thrilling. It's about how interesting it is to pick it apart, to find the secrets hiding within. Okay, so let's look at the questions. One, in the first paragraph, the author uses a metaphor to compare how we experience everyday life to A, a summer's day, B, a tem tender reminiscence of childhood. C, a series of flashbacks. D, a mountain torrent. Or E, a freeze frame. Now, hit the pause button. Take your time and answer the question. When you're ready, come back. OK, before we talk about the answers, I have a question for you. Was your answer found by A, hunting back in the passage and trying to solve the problem on your own, or B, browsing at the answer choices until you found one that seemed right. If you did B, you're a shopper. You probably got the answer wrong. If there's a single idea that you need to come away from from this course, it's that you must avoid looking at the answer choices until you've come up with an answer on your own. Solve the problem first, then go to the answers. Do this every time you can. I say when you can, because there are occasionally questions which work backwards, but we'll hold that thought. So solve the problem, find the answer. You'd be amazed how many people just won't do it. If you're one of them, here's a, a Zen idea to roll around with. You have to be there before you can go there. Be there before you go there, what do I mean? Well, you can't become head of software development at some company before you know how to write code, can you? So why should you think you can answer or a question just because a bunch of words are flapping around in your face? If you're doing that, you're back in the shopping mall looking at advertising. And in that shopping mall, most of what's on sale isn't what you're looking for, even if it's silver and gold and Britney Spears was wearing it. In the shopping mall called A, B, C, D, and E, the answer choices given are all they're designed to draw you towards those which are wrong. How dare they? And how did they do it? Well, let's do a different kind of test now, a test about your answers. I can tell you right now, a certain number of you answered B, and another certain number of you answered C. Apart from the law of averages, how do I know that? Well, those of you who watch the theory segment on shopping versus analyzing might already know why. It's because of grandma. You chose B, tender reminiscences, because you recognized elements within the text 
that suggested childhood reminiscences and flashbacks. For example, carefree childhood 4th of July at grandmother's farm eating huckleberry pie on a warm summer's afternoon, blah, blah, blah. But the question isn't asking if we have reminiscences or flashbacks or what they might consist of. It's asking, quote, to what is the passage comparing the way we experience everyday life and how we do so using a metaphor. So sorry, no offense to your family, but leave grandma out of it. This raises the next question. What do we mean by experience of everyday life? Is that the same thing as everyday life? I hope you said no, because an experience of something isn't the same thing as the thing itself, any more than a documentary film about a war is the same thing as a war. Otherwise, I can't believe I survived that encounter with Ken Burns on PBS. Now, let me ask you something. Everyday life. How do we talk about everyday life? The things we experience, what part of speech or parts of speech will express those concepts? I hope you said nouns. Things, concept, these are nouns, except for their modifiers, which are adjectives. The way we experience life, how we experience life, a metaphor for how we experience experience. What parts of speech will we use to get that across? That's right, verbs and adverbs. So a question that asks us how we experience something isn't going to be solved by looking for nouns. But for verbs and adverbs, we're looking for a metaphor made up of verbs and adverbs. Pretty good clue. Now, this is a tool we can use to bend back the surface of the passage, because now that we understand the question, we might actually begin to answer it. How? By removing the words that obviously don't concern us, the nouns and adjectives, and by making a list of the verbs and adverbs and see if a metaphor pops out. Now, look at the paragraph again. Make your list. When you're ready, come back. You have your list? Good, because here's mine. Rush, flickers, splashing, forget, row, cascades, floods, freezes. I hope you see a pattern emerging. Not that every verb fits the pattern, but most of them do. And this is not a pattern we recognize by association, but by analysis. And the pattern is that of a river. Let's look at the answers now, and let's take our metaphor, this river, and we'll call it our predicted answer. In fact, it's a kind of scientific hypothesis we made by analyzing the chemical forms, the words of the substance, the paragraph, under observation. We reach this hypothesis by looking at the evidence, you understand? And let's see how our river matches up with A, a summer's day. Well, not exactly. So what do we do? We cross A off our list. It's gone. How about B? which some of you probably are losing your affection for now. It's out, and C is gone too. You could choose freeze frame because we had the word freeze, but that would be pretty perverse. The numbers are against you. There's only that one word. Of course, freeze is a word we've seen before, so again, you might be tempted if you hadn't done the work. But we did the work, and we have the answer D, a mountain torrent. By the way, a torrent is a kind of river, for those of you who have it in your vocabulary. And if you don't, you better get it there. Now let's look at question number two. The author uses the first line of the second paragraph in order to A. Indicate uncertainty about something to follow. B. Contradict a scientific argument. C. Change the subject. D. Shift the discussion to a different level. Or E. Introduce a second example. This kind of question is a common one. The author uses the line in order to. That's like asking why he's doing it. Isn't that a dumb question if you're trying to understand what he's saying? But that's just it. The SAT isn't just interested in what's in the text. Sometimes it wants to know why it's in the text. The same way a policeman might be interested in knowing why a suspect committed a crime, because they often can figure that out, even if the suspect won't tell them. It's all in the evidence. Which brings us to our second strategy, this crime scene idea. Those of you who've watched the theory segment know where this is going. We have to look at the passage as an object, as a crime scene. Imagine you're a policeman. You found the passage in a car. You know the owner of the car who has disappeared is the main suspect in a serious crime, but you don't know anything about him except that he wrote the passage and it's found in the front seat. From that, you have to figure out his personality, his job, his deep-seated desires, etc. If you can't do this, you don't belong in the investigations department. The way to get to the answer to this question is to find the main purpose of the passage. If we know what the guy or girl is trying to say, we might be able to see that the words he uses to get there are probably going to be linked to that he's unlikely to organize his material in a way which contradicts his main purpose. 
Hint, the SAT usually doesn't pick passages written by self-destructive maniacs, so you're safe assuming the writers they choose organize the material in such a way as to support their main idea. How do we find the main purpose? Let's do a quick checkup of the passage. How many paragraphs are there? Two. What's the first paragraph about? How we experience experience like a river? Good. What's the second paragraph about? That that experience, our river metaphor, is itself a construction, an illusion, invented by the complex mechanisms of the human brain. Now, why would someone spend time setting up a metaphor, the river, only to deconstruct it a moment later? Answer that, and you have the author's purpose. Have you ever picked a fight with someone? Hey, jerk, what do you think about mashed potatoes? Oh, you like them, huh? Well, they're full of cancer-causing chemicals put there by some guy at a corporation. So, the mashed potato line, what was that? A way of luring some guy you met on a bus into being your audience, trying to find a way to share something with him, only to smash his illusions once you got him. It's kind of rude, but hey, it happens. And you were only trying to share this information for his benefit, right? So you did this because you're trying to make him understand that something he takes for granted, potatoes, might actually be killing him. So in a general sense, you're trying to make him see something from a new perspective. That must be the author's purpose then, right? To make us see from a new perspective. Let's match this, our prediction, to the answers that were given. The author uses the first line of the second paragraph in order to A. Indicate uncertainty about something to follow. Is that the same as seeing from a new perspective? Remember, that's our predicted answer. Not really. So it's out. How about B? Contradict a scientific argument. That could be, but it doesn't have to be, so let's take it off the list. C, changing the subject. Change the subject too generally. D, shift the discussion to a different level. Ah, that's good, we'll keep it on for now. E, introduce a second example. Example? Is the second paragraph a second example? And is there only one example of something in the first? You see my point? The way to approach these critical thinking questions on the SAT is very simple. You answer them based on careful reading of the questions and close analysis of the text. The pertinent part of the text, I should say, because on the longer passage especially, it won't always be necessary to read the whole thing, just as the president doesn't have to read all 2,500 pages of the new tax bill before he signs it. He knows the big picture. He can check out the details inside the boilerplate. Big point. The biggest mistake you can make is to go straight to the answer choices and try to pick and choose, because then you're shopping, remember? and you're not playing your game, you're playing their game, and you're probably going to lose. Fine, I can hear some of you saying, but it'll take too long to think everything through like this. And it will, until you're good at it. Then you'll do it in a flash. And with those few questions that take a really long time to analyze, you'll learn to do them last. Now let's turn to the third question about the short passage. The structure of this passage could best be described as A, cause and effect, B, scientific analysis of the human neurological system, C, binary. D, an exploration of the richness and diversity of American life. Or E, a series of episodes followed by the presentation of a theory. Structure. Some of you are asking, what is structure? Unless you're in AP English classes, you probably have no idea what that is. In simple terms, it's the form in which the material has been shaped, the bottle the wine has been poured into. Hint, it's not the wine. So how do we find it? We look at the outlines, the contours of the piece, like, how many paragraphs are there? Did you say two? Good. And the two parts sort of contradict each other, right? Hint, remember our discussion about the potato and the chemicals? Do we have statistics? Do we have lab results or interviews? Anything like that? No. Then it's probably not a research paper. Do we have dreams, hopes, inner monologue, and dramatic conflict? Then we're not dealing with a spy novel. So what is this? Remember, what is this, not what's in it? Well, it's a think piece, a little think piece that might make a nice filler article in a science section of a news weekly. It's not someone's op-ed. It's not reporting on a major lab result. It doesn't have a series of episodes. Two isn't a series, so E is out. It talks about the 4th of July, but the think piece is on the brain, so D is out. There's no analysis, as we said, so there goes B. Cause and effect? Is the second paragraph about something caused by the first? Hardly, so we're left with C. Binary. It's not a very good answer, is it? No. Binary is a pretty sorry answer. But it's the only one that isn't flat out wrong. And that's an important lesson about this test, too. Just like in the human resources department at an American car company, sometimes the best choice you've got is still a lemon. Is that a life lesson or what? 
So what does binary mean anyway? Well, at least one of the definitions is, quote, something that has two parts. Well, it's not wrong. So in this case, it's right. And none of the other choices can claim that. The test just got harder and easier. I'm Bill Rubenstein, your SAT expert at professorate.com.